I invite you to join me this morning to the Gospel of Matthew, the very first book in your New Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are the four Gospels, and today we come to the very first one, Matthew. We're going to begin reading in Matthew chapter 5. We'll read beginning in verse 1 and read through verse 10. But our focus this morning will be on verse 3. Today I'm privileged and very excited to begin a series of sermons throughout the rest of the summer here at our church on the Beatitudes, which is the beginning of Jesus' famous sermon on the Mount. And so for the next several weeks after today, we will consider one Beatitude each Sunday. Now, some of you are thinking, hey, look, I know those Beatitudes. I, I know most of them by heart, and they're, you know, pretty simple. And uh, why would you spend so much time uh, on just little short verses here for the next eight weeks? Oh, my goodness, you would ask such a question. Oh, how much there is in the Word of God that we don't know. I'm amazed when I come to Scripture. You know, I've been reading the Bible a long time. And I'm amazed when I come to texts of Scripture that I've read many times, and yet when I immerse myself in them and ask God to speak to me once again fresh and anew, He always opens up new windows and allows me to see new vistas of His truth. That's what will happen today. That's what will happen over the next eight weeks as we consider these verses. Matthew chapter 5. This is the beginning of the account of Jesus' famous sermon on the mount. Beginning in verse 1. When he saw the crowds, he went up on the mountain. And after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the humble, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. There are many sermons in the Bible that I wish I could have attended, been a fly on the wall listening when that sermon was preached. Moses preached his last sermon in Deuteronomy 33. I wish I could have been there. Isaiah preached famous sermons in his great book, sometimes about the second coming of Jesus. I wish I could have heard them. Jeremiah preached a famous court sermon in the presence of the king that got him arrested and thrown in jail. John the Baptist preached out in the wilderness with his strange diet and his even stranger clothing, and yet people of all walks of life came to hear that man preach, John the Baptist, I wish I had been there. Peter preached that first sermon at Pentecost, and 3,000 people were saved. I would have loved to have heard the three-time denier preach that sermon at Pentecost. And then there's Paul's famous sermon to Athens, Greece. They are recorded in Acts chapter 17. Oh, would I have loved to have seen the faces of the philosophers when Paul preached in Acts 17. But of all the sermons I wish I could have attended, it would be the sermon that Jesus preached that day on the northern shore of the Sea of Galilee, a place where I myself have stood. Maybe some of you have been there as well. Standing there, there's a mountain area, and then there's, as you descend, there's sort of a plain, large plain area, and you continue to descend, and there are the beautiful waters of the Sea of Galilee. Somewhere there off of that northern shore, on one of those lower plains in sight of the high place, the mountain area, Jesus preached what has come to be called the Sermon on the Mount. These verses are admired by all kinds of people, believers as well as non-believers. But these verses are more to be admired than to be admired. They are to be obeyed. In 1948, at the end of the war, General Omar Bradley preached or spoke, and he said, We have grasped the mystery of the atom, 
but we have rejected the Sermon on the Mount. If that were true in 1948, it is certainly true today in our day and time. Never has a sermon been more practical. Never has a sermon been more relevant. And so Matthew introduces us to the Sermon on the Mount, and he tells us in verse 1 that when Jesus saw the crowds, there were always crowds who followed Jesus. There was something unusual, something unique, something different about the Lord. He attracted people. And when he spoke, people were mesmerized at his words, and they listened attentively. And when he saw the crowds, he was concerned about them, each and every single member of the crowd. And that's the wonderful thing about Jesus is he's not only interested in the crowds, he's actually interested in the individuals who make up that crowd. When he saw the crowds, he went up on the mountain. Now, that's a very interesting statement. He went up on the mountain. Interestingly enough, that's the exact terminology in Exodus that describes Moses going up on the mountain to receive the law of God. And here is Jesus, the greater prophet than Moses, goes up on the mountain to preach the laws of God. He goes up on the mountain, and after he sat down, notice that, That's the position of the rabbi in Judaism. In the days of the first century, when you went to the synagogue, if you were Jewish, you stood and the preachers sat down. How about if we try that one Sunday? (laughs) I'm going to bring my chair, and I'm going to put it right here, and my little table with my Bible, and all of you, in honor of the Word of God, you all are going to stand the entire service. And I'm going to sit and I'm going to teach Rabbi David teaching here at Sunnyvale. Well, he sat down is the Bible's way of expressing that Jesus is a teacher. And furthermore, we are told that his disciples came to him. Now, there was a large crowd, but in that inner circle of that crowd, there were all of his immediate followers, his 12 disciples, and then those who were beginning to follow him more closely. And not translated in most Bibles, in a few translations you'll read it, but the Greek text says, he opened his mouth and he taught them. Now most people just uh, summarize that. Uh, For example, the CSB says, then he began to teach them. But the idea of he opened his mouth is a statement that expresses the solemnity of the occasion and the importance of the words that are about to cascade over the lips of the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, this is no ordinary sermon. You've heard sermons. I've preached them. I've heard them too. But there's never a sermon that can be listened to as should be listened to whenever we're listening to the Lord himself. And that's exactly what we are about to do. We are about to hear the words of Jesus. There is a certain solemnity to the occasion. There is a certain seriousness and importance to his words. And then finally we are told, and he taught them, and then he moves into the sermon. Jesus is the great teacher. We have the privilege today and over the next several Sundays of sitting at the feet of Jesus. Now, in one sense, every time the Bible is preached, whether it's Genesis to Revelation, all of the Bible is the Word of God. And every time we hear the Word of God preached, we are, in a sense, sitting at the feet of Jesus. But here is a sermon from the Lord Jesus Christ himself. He taught them. Now, the the background here, the picture that Matthew is drawing is the picture of Moses on the mountain receiving the law of God. He went up into the mountain. Exodus 19, verse 3 is the exact same words in the Greek translation of the Hebrew that you read right here in the Greek New Testament. He went up on the mountain. Matthew is giving us is drawing a comparison between Moses the prophet and then in the Old Testament God said to Moses I'm going to send the people a prophet greater than you and that is a messianic statement a prophecy about the coming of Jesus so now Moses went up on the mountain in Exodus but here Jesus has come in the flesh the son of the living God he goes up on the mountain and he sits down in front of the people and he teaches them the word of God. Deuteronomy 33 is Moses' last sermon, and in verse 29, Moses says this, Blessed are you, O Israel, 
because God is among you and you are obeying him. Interesting to me, that's exactly how Jesus begins his sermon. The first word out of his mouth in verse 3 in the sermon is blessed. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. There are eight pronouncements here in what you and I call the Beatitudes. They are interesting in so many ways. That word, Beatitude, that we call these eight pronouncements, these eight declarations, each of which begins with the word blessed. The word Beatitude comes from the Latin word that means blessed. It means happy. Some people translate this, happy is the person. Others translate this, congratulations are those who are poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. There is a simplicity of each of these eight beatitudes and yet a profundity of thought that we find in them. There is a certain symmetry. They all begin the same way. They all are simple terse statements. They are bifurcated in the very middle. You have a statement, blessed are the poor in spirit, and then you have the final statement, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, they will be comforted. There's a symmetry in each one of these Beatitudes. Notice also that there is something unique to the very first Beatitude and the last Beatitude. Notice, blessed are the poor in spirit, verse 3, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Notice the last Beatitude in verse 10. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The very first beatitude and the last beatitude end in exactly the same way. The first four of these eight beatitudes relate to God, your relationship to God. The last four relate to your relationship to everyone else. Now these beatitudes are not written for elitist spiritual Christians. No, they are not written for the spiritual aristocracy. They are for all of us, whether you're a new Christian or you've been a Christian many years. Whether you're old or young, it doesn't matter. This is not written to super-duper spiritual people. These are the words of our Lord that express His desire for all of us. Every one of us should emulate and should be examples of the Beatitudes that our Lord gives. And so I notice He begins with that word, blessed. This particular word is a real difficult situation for Bible translators because it does mean blessed, but it means many other things. The word itself is not a word that describes anything that is dependent on your outward circumstances. Oh, I'm blessed today. I got that job. Oh, I'm blessed today. Uh, He asked me out for a date. Oh, I'm blessed today. I got a raise. Yep, all of that's true. But you see, if you know the Lord as your Savior, what Jesus is saying as we delve deeper into these verses is whatever your circumstances are, you are described as being in a state of blessedness. You get that job, you're blessed. But if you lose that job, you are still blessed. If you have health, you are blessed. If you lose that health, you are still blessed. Blessing is not something, according to Scripture, that is in any way dependent on your circumstances. It is independent of all changes of life. Whatever may happen, sink or swim, live or die, you are blessed. You are in a relationship with God in such a way that He has blessed you. Now, this is a statement that indicates divine favor. Yes, there's an active aspect to it. God's the one who blesses, who is the giver of all blessings. But it is also important for you to note that this statement of declaration is an observation of a way of being in the world. In fact, it's more that, it's more the latter than the former. It is more a description of who you are, less of what you do, though what you do is a part of it. This is a description of who the Christian is. This is a description of who the person is, the condition that they are in if they know Christ as Lord and Savior. Every true Christian, every saved person is in this condition. 
Now you'll never understand this, these beatitudes and the meaning of this word blessed if we do not understand Psalm 1, which is a very parallel passage and in which these beatitudes in some ways and the whole Sermon on the Mount are compared to by Christ. Now you need not turn, don't do that, just sort of hold your place here. But listen carefully, let me read once again Psalm 1. It begins with the very same word of Jesus' beatitude. Listen, Psalm 1. How happy, blessed is the one who doesn't walk in the advice of the wicked or stand in the pathway of sinners or sit in the company of the mockers. Instead, his delight is in the law of the Lord and he meditates on it day and night. He's like a tree planted beside flowing streams, bearing its fruit in its season, whose leaf does not wither. Whatever he does prospers. Not so the wicked. They are like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the day of judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked shall perish. The way of the wicked leads to ruin. Now, keep that in mind, all right? Do something with me, all right? Keep that in mind. Turn to Matthew chapter 7, the very end of the Sermon on the Mount. Keep everything, those six verses in Psalm 1 you just heard. Now look at Matthew chapter 7. And let's begin in verse 13. And I want you to listen carefully and see if you hear anything from the lips of Jesus that you heard in Psalm 1. Matthew chapter 7, beginning in verse 13. Enter through the narrow gate. For the gate's wide and the road broad that leads to destruction. And many go through it, but oh, how narrow is the gate and difficult the road that leads to eternal life, and few find it. Be on your guard against false prophets who come in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they're rav ravaging wolves. You'll recognize them by their fruit. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? In the same way, every good tree produces good fruit. Psalm 1. But a bad tree produces bad fruit. A good tree can't produce bad fruit. Neither can a bad tree produce good fruit. Every tree that doesn't produce good fruit is cut down, thrown into the fire. So you'll recognize them by their fruit. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. On that day many will say, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name? We drove out demons in your name. We did miracles in your name. Then I will announce to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you lawbreakers. Verse 24, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them will be like a wise man who builds his house on the rock. The rain fell, the rivers rose, the winds blew, pounded that house. And it didn't collapse. Its foundation was on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and doesn't act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell, the rivers rose, the winds blew and pounded that house. And it collapsed and great was the collapse of it. Look at the similarities. There are at least six between Psalm 1 and how Jesus ends the Sermon on the Mount. Both speak of the two ways. The way of the godly, the way of the ungodly. Both invite hearers to the path of wisdom. Look at verse 24. Both use fruit-bearing trees as the key metaphor. Look at verses 16 through 20. Both speak of final judgment and separation of the wicked from the righteous. Chapter 7, verses 21 through 23. Both identify whom the Lord knows and whom he does not know. Back in Psalm 1 and now Matthew 7, 23. Both emphasize the need to hear and to heed God's Word. Verse 24, again, Psalm 1. Now, oh, isn't that interesting? Psalm 1 begins with the very same word that the Sermon on the Mount begins with. Blessed, blessed. Now, the idea here, I want you to get the meaning. We're going to drill down just a little deeper, all right? Are you with me? We're going to go a little deeper. The word does mean happy. It's sort of a declaration. Congratulations. It's sort of like a, a big announcement. Hey, you know, my daughter's getting married. 
It's a, it's a big announcement. Blessed. But I want you to notice carefully that the meaning of this word is really the idea of flourishing. All right? Flourishing. Like a flower flourishes, like a bush flourishes. Kate and I, yesterday morning, walked the perimeter of our house, sort of looking at some of the plants and things that we have had a place to beautify our home, the exterior of our home. And we have a number of hostas. And I didn't know what a hosta was until Kate had them planted there in the house and outside the house, so she's explaining them to me. But they're very beautiful. They have that two or three shades of green, beautiful plants, beautiful hostas. And we have several hostas out front, and all of them but one are doing very well. They're all flourishing. But one is puny, and we can't figure out why. It's in the same soil, same location, gets the same amount of water, same amount of sunshine. But for whatever reason, it's not flourishing. It's not like a well-watered tree or a plant. Its well-being is diminished. What Jesus is wanting to say to you and me today, and over these next several weeks, he wants to describe for you what it means for you to be a person who can be described as well-being. A person who, like a tree or a plant, Psalm 1 or here, is flourishing, is growing, and thus happy, blessed. I want to make sure you get the picture here. Jesus said in John 10, 10, I have come that you may have life and have it more abundantly. Jesus doesn't just want you to survive. He wants you to flourish. He wants you to grow, to be happy, to experience all that he has for you. you he wants you to be the flourishing Christian. And the key to that, according to Psalm 1, and according to the Beatitudes in Matthew 5, the key to that is obedience. Obedience. It is the map. It's the compass. It's the rudder, and it's the provision on the journey of your Christian life. What makes a blessing is the fact of the blessing of God's relationship to you, not the benefits that come to you in the blessing. That's what the Beatitudes are all about. The key here is a relationship. The blessed person is the person who knows God and whom God knows. You are blessed today because you are in Christ Jesus. You are blessed today because you are the beneficiary of God's salvation. He has brought you into his family. That is your state. That is your condition. It's not just what you do. It is who you are. That's what is often missed in these Beatitudes. People read these and they say, oh, well, I need to be humble of spirit or I need to mourn or I need to do this. And there's an element of truth to that, but it's far, far more than that. It's not descriptive so much of an action as it is a state of being. You're a flourishing person. Blessed, happy is the person. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Yes, it connotes divine behavior or divine favor on your life. But it means more than that. It's way more than, hey, if I do this, then God will bless me. No, that's the tit-for-tat slot machine view of God. That's, it means way more than that. Now, God does give us his blessings, but his blessings are acts of grace. And that's what we need to learn and be reminded of today when we come to these. You see, if you're not careful, you'll read both Psalm 1 and the Beatitudes wrongly. Psalm 1 begins what? Blessed is a man, doesn't walk in counsel of the ungodly, doesn't stand with the sinners or sit in the seat of the scoffers, but rather his delights in the Word of God. So people read that and they say, okay, that means don't hang out around bad people, read your Bible and God will bless you. Well, yeah, don't hang around bad people and read your Bible. Those are good things, but that's the very simple surface reading. That's not how, that's not the point. 
This is a proclamation of a state of being, not an announcement on what to do in order to get God's blessings. Here is our way of living in the world. This is who we are as Christians. You can't even become a Christian until you are poor in spirit and humble yourself and come to God, laying aside your pride in order to be saved. We're talking about flourishing spiritually. Our way of living in the world it's true flourishing in a spiritual way. I find it interesting that as I read through these eight Beatitudes, each one of them describes how Jesus himself lived. Jesus himself was humble in spirit. Jesus himself mourned over the sins of others. Jesus himself hungered and thirsted for righteousness. Jesus himself is pure in heart. Jesus himself is the one who shows mercy. And Jesus himself is the peacemaker, the one who brings peace. Everything Jesus talks about in these Beatitudes and describes as the condition we ought to be in, he is and he does. He is the perfect example of of the Beatitudes. Well, let's drill this a little deeper. We spent all that time on that word blessed. We understand that it means a flourishing life. Does that describe you today? I mean, do you view yourself that way? Do you consider yourself that way? Are you that flourishing hosta there? Or are you the puny hosta that's not doing so well? Which one are you? Well, Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit. Mark that phrase, the poor in spirit. Now let's make sure we understand what that does not mean. Notice Jesus, Jesus doesn't say blessed are the poor. Because he is not here talking about economic poverty. Nor is Jesus exalting poverty or saying somehow that those who are economically poor are in a special blessing from God. In fact, if you're in an economically poor state, you don't consider yourself very blessed. Uh, most people wouldn't look at it that way, Right? So he's not talking here about economic poverty. Nor is Jesus talking about people who are poor spirited, people who have an anemic self-image, people who can't make their way through a single day without calling their psychiatrist. That's not the, what Jesus means when he said, blessed are the poor in spirit. Nor is Jesus talking about the perpetual defeated person, the Eeyore, you know, the Eeyore. Mr. Donkey Eeyore, you remember Eeyore? An unending series of accepted defeats. That's my life. No, he's not talking about any of that. Well, if that is not what he's talking about, what does Jesus mean when he said, happy, congratulations, blessed, flourishing is the person who is poor in spirit? Here's what it means. This is a descriptor of people who recognize who they really are when all the veneer is stripped away and God himself knows them and sees them for who they are spiritually. That is the description. It is a person who recognizes I'm spiritually destitute before God. I am bankrupt without the grace of God with no pretense stripped of my self-sufficiency. That's what the word describes. The poor in spirit is the person who's hit rock bottom. It's the person who knows he has nothing to offer. He is nothing, has nothing. He is nothing. He is a beggar in spirit. He is a person or she is a person who recognizes their spiritual poverty and their spiritual bankruptcy. This is the proper perspective of yourself and it is the opposite of pride and self-righteousness. It is the total opposite of pride and self-righteousness. Blessed are the poor in spirit. It's a humility, which is a Godward virtue, and it is the opposite of pride, which is a Godward vice. Pride is the central sin of our lives. Pride is what keeps virtually all people from ever coming to God in the first place. People don't want to repent of their sin and be saved. Why? Pride. Those of you listening to me today, if you're here or watching me online and you're not a Christian, what keeps you from becoming a Christian, frankly, is your pride. 
That's what keeps most people from coming to Christ. This is the word that best describes who you are before God, whether you realize it or not. You are poor in spirit. You are not proud in spirit. Adrian Rogers used to talk about people who are strutting their way to hell, thinking they are too good to be damned. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Isn't it interesting, the first beatitude is the absence of any praiseworthy quality, not the presence of any quality or virtue. Here you are confessing your utter dependence on God. Is that how you feel today? Do you live that way? Do you think that way? Do you recognize that apart from God you can do nothing and you are nothing? Do you recognize you have no ability to stand before God in your own knowledge, in your own life, in your own whatever you've done? Well, I'm vice president of the company. Who cares? That won't get you one whit in God's good graces. It is a condition, not just an attitude. This is the way, the reason Jesus begins here is this is how you begin your Christian life. You can't come to Christ and find salvation unless you come like a little child, Jesus said. You've got to come with humility. You've got to come recognizing you are a sinner. You've got to turn away your self-pride, your self-importance. You've got to put all of that aside and come and say, God, I need you. Nothing in my hand I bring. Simply to your cross I cling, as the old hymn used to put it. That's who you are. That's who we are in God's presence. It is the way the Christian life is initiated. Nobody can be saved in their pride. You have to humble yourself in order to be saved. You have to recognize you are a sinner and admit that before God and come with a poor spirit recognizing who you are. That's the way the Christian life begins. Jesus says that's the way it continues. Blessed are present tense those who are poor in spirit. The best example of this is the Pharisee and the tax collector. Don't turn, just listen to me read it. Luke chapter 18. Mark it down so you can read it later. Luke chapter 18. I want you to hear about Jesus and the tax collector. In Luke chapter 18, beginning in verse 9, Jesus told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and looked down on everyone else. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. The Pharisee was standing and praying like this about himself. God, I thank you I'm not like other people. I'm not greedy. I'm not unrighteous. Not an adulterer. And Lord, I'm not like this tax collector. I fast twice a week, give a tenth of everything I get. I'm a tither, Lord. Verse 13. But the tax collector standing far off would not even raise his eyes to heaven. But he kept striking his chest and saying, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you, this one went down to his house justified rather than the other because everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. You see, if you lived in the first century by anyone's standards, a Pharisee was the best of the best. And a tax collector was the lowest of the lowest because he was a thief, an extortioner, a traitor to his own people. Every Jew hated every tax collector. I mean, they were the worst scum of the earth to be a tax collector. If the Pharisee showed up at your house to marry your daughter, you would say, oh, Come right in. Yes, I love your resume. You're such a clean-cut guy. You bet. I want my daughter to marry you. If the tax collector showed up to your house, you would loathe him, tell him to get his carcass out of here. You're not going to get within 10 feet of my daughter. And yet Jesus said the Pharisee is the one who couldn't get within a 1,000 miles of God because of his pride. And the tax collector who had lived a sorry life, who had been a thief and an extortionist, yet came to realize the sin of his life. And when he repented and called his sin what God calls it, immediately God accepted him. Not the self-righteous Baptist church member. That's the Pharisee whom God rejected. 
No, it was the tax collector, the scum of the earth, the pimp and the prostitute out there are the ones who because of their repentance and they were poor in spirit, God received them. Middle C is the lowest of the octave of the eight on the piano or on the music sheet, but it's the beginning. It's the lowest, but it's the key point. That's why it's called middle C, and you work your way up from there, back up the octave to C again. That's the paradox. Blessed are the poor in spirit. What? Can you imagine how stunned the crowd was that day on the Sermon on the Mount when they heard Jesus begin his sermon that way? Their mouths dropped open. Their eyes widened. They couldn't believe it. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Are you crazy? Happy are those the world considers unhappy, Jesus says. Not exactly the way to have your best life now. Jesus said, happy are the losers because they are the true winners. What? That's not how it works, Lord. That's not how we function. That's not how we live. That's not how the world works. Oh, the paradox of what Jesus said. It is absolutely stunning. Happiness consists not in what you have. It consists in who you are and whose you are. It's not about your circumstances. It's about your soul. The beatitude today is blessed is he who has health, wealth, and friends. That's the world's beatitude. Jesus said, blessed is the one who is poor in spirit. The distance to the nearest fixed star is pretty much the same from the top of one anthill to the other, even if the second anthill is a foot taller than the previous one. They're both <laughs> millions of miles away. Two people may owe $10 million. One may have $1,000. The other has $1. One has 1,000 times more than the other, but they're both totally bankrupt when it comes to getting to God. Don't think you're too good because you may just think you're too good to be saved. And you're too good to be damned. And so you'll just strut your way on to hell because you think you're too good to be damned. If you don't know you're dying of thirst, all the water on earth won't help you. And if you don't realize that you're spiritually bankrupt, if you don't realize that you are nothing and God is everything, if you don't realize there's no salvation, you can't pull yourself up by your bootstraps, if you don't realize that you can't keep all the Ten Commandments and somehow make God let you into heaven, if you don't realize that you can't give your way to heaven, can't join enough churches, can't be baptized in enough baptistries, can't do enough good things, because you cannot, if you don't realize that, you're going to live a lifetime and die and go to hell. Because you miss the truth of the opening line of Jesus' famous sermon on the mount. Blessed are the poor in spirit. It is Jesus who determines who is blessed. Not you. Certainly not the world. It's Jesus who determines who is blessed. But now notice he says, blessed are the poor in spirit for. I want to translate that little word in Greek, the little hati word there in Greek. I want to translate it because. It'll help make it clear. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Why are you blessed? If you're poor in spirit, if you're a loser from the world standpoint, and yet you're blessed, how can that be? Because you're a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. Oh, my goodness. It's an explanation for this radical paradox of being poor in spirit. Despite appearances, despite of how the world looks at it, the humble ones, they're the possessors of God's kingdom. They're the members of the great kingdom with the great king. That's who the poor in spirit are. That's who every Christian is. I remember when I was a kid, We'd watch Mutual of Omaha's, what? Those of you that are my age, Wild Kingdom. 
Oh, you remember that, those of you that are my age. Or we would come home from church if we got home soon enough to catch it and we would watch Disney's, Walt Disney's, we would talk about and watch the Magic Kingdom. Or today we take our children to Disney World and to the Magic Kingdom. Did you know God has a kingdom? It's not a term that we use today. We have a government, and it's a, republic, a form of a republic kind of government, and we don't have a kingdom anymore. We don't have a king who reigns over America. We never have had. The English have had kings. The French have had kings. Many other nations have had kings in the past, some still today, kings and queens. But no, we're not very familiar with that terminology, a kingdom. What is that? We don't know what that is but Jesus talked more about the kingdom of God. In fact, in Matthew 4, before you get to Matthew 5, Jesus came preaching the kingdom of God. The key theme of his preaching is the kingdom of God. The key theme of the three-chapter Sermon on the Mount is God's rule and God's reign. And that's what the kingdom of God is. It's the rule of God now on the earth. It's the reign of God and the realm of that reign. And even though the world doesn't know it and can't see it, you and I are a part of it. It's the only kingdom that matters. It's the only kingdom that's going to last forever. All of the other kingdoms are going to be gone. All the other nations ultimately are going to end. And in heaven, there will be one king and one kingdom for all time. And that's King Jesus and his kingdom. And you and I are a part of it. You're a part of the kingdom of God. Those who humble themselves and get into a right relationship with God are members of the kingdom. Isn't that wonderful? And the kingdom of God is interesting because it's both now and it's not yet. You say, what? what? How can it be now and not yet? Well, it can be now because Jesus said, hey, by my coming, the kingdom of God is among you. And then he said, the kingdom of God is in you. And then he said, one day I'm coming again and going to right every injustice and every wrong and I'm going to reign and the kingdom of God's going to be on this earth and then it's going to last for all eternity. There's a now and there's a not yet to the kingdom of God. You and I live in the now and that's why Jesus, when he talks about problems and tri trials and persecutions and problems and Christians who were put to death in the first century, that's how they could survive. That's how they could flourish and thrive because their kingdom was not of this world and neither is ours. And if ever we need to remember that, it is now in this country and in this world. This is the, talking about a different kingdom. We're talking about the kingdom of God. Theirs is the kingdom of God. There's another kingdom in the midst of the Roman Empire, Jesus said. By the way, if you were a Roman living in these days, or a Jew as these were who first heard Jesus preach this, then there are treasonous words. Jesus is saying there is another kingdom other than Rome. He's not challenging Rome. He's not coming as a revolutionary. No, the gospel never comes as a revolution to take over somebody's government. The gospel always comes as a personal revolution to take over your heart and to save you from your sin. It's an inside job. And all of those who know Christ are in the kingdom and they're a part of God's revolution. A whole different set of values and worldview from the Roman Empire when you come to know Christ. You know whose you are. You know to whom you belong. You know where you are. And now Jesus says you know how you are supposed to live because the kingdom of heaven includes all of the blessings of the Beatitudes. This is where it begins. Blessed are the poor in spirit, the humble, the broken, those who have gotten rid of their pride. Blessed are the poor in spirit, theirs. And that little word in Greek is in the emphatic position. It means the, uh, it describes the unexpected nature of the blessing. Hey, it's the poor in spirit who are in the kingdom of God. And theirs, and the meaning is they and they only are in the kingdom of God. This is God's entrance exam. This is what you've got to pass to get in. You've got to humble yourself, admit your sin, call on God, experience His grace and be saved, and bingo, you are in the kingdom. It's not rocket science. Anybody can do it anywhere. 
You're in the kingdom when you do that. The crown of the kingdom will only fit on the head of the poor in spirit. The owners of nothing become the inheritors of everything. That's who we are for those of us who know Christ. Only the feet, only the foot of the poor in spirit can fit the glass slipper that the Prince of Peace brings when he comes to your life. Those are the ones who are in the kingdom. They don't look like it now. That's little Cinderella out there. Nobody cares about her. But when the prince comes and when the, go, when the glass slippers placed on her foot, everybody discovers who she was incognito. She was a pauper, but now she is a princess. That's who you are in Christ today. The world thinks nothing of you. In fact, the world hates you. We're going to find later in a beatitude that if you are a Christian, you're going to be persecuted. And that is beginning to develop in this country even right now. Amen. The time is coming when persecution will not be passive in this land. For those who know Christ, it will be active. The poor in spirit are royalty incognito on this earth. That's who you are. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Theirs, they and they alone, is to them and they alone. This is present tense, not just future, present, now. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. That, well, is just the beginning of Jesus' first sentence of his Sermon on the Mount. Aren't you glad you know the king? When all hell breaks loose and all the troubles and trials and problems and COVID and rioting and everything else and the injustice that goes on and all of the things that happen, you want to just throw up your hands and say, oh my goodness. But there is a king who reigns over all and who one day is coming again and he's going to make it all right. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Do you know Christ today? Listening to my voice, do you know the Lord is your Savior? If you don't, I wonder, can you be humble enough to give up your pride, your status. Oh, this is who I am. This is what I've achieved. Are you willing to recognize that to God it doesn't amount to a hill of beans, but that God loves you so much and cares about you and desires that you flourish? He desires that you be blessed. He desires you to be in his kingdom. And so much does he desire that, that Jesus came and suffered the greatest suffering you can possibly imagine, dying in your place on the cross for your sin. Jesus paid that price. Such is the king's love for you and desire that you become a part of his kingdom. Would you come to Christ today? Whether you're in this building, in this balcony, lower floor, whether you're watching me online, whatever the case is, in a moment when I pray, we're going to take a moment to respond to this wonderful word from Christ in the first sentence of his sermon. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Folks, it doesn't get any better than that. Come to Jesus today. Come to Christ today. I'm going to lead us in prayer, and then we're going to do business with God for just a moment. Heavenly Father, thank you for the word of Christ in the beginning of his sermon. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. God, help us now, those who don't know you right now, to become poor in spirit, to admit who they are, that they can bring nothing to you that would earn their salvation. It's a gift of grace that you give them in Christ. Help them, Father, now to come and receive Christ. In this building, those listening online, Lord, help them to bow right where they are and just give their heart to Christ by faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen.